30 with 30 seconds. So um, let's do a very quick introduction. So uh, this is the theoretical foundations to uh, the session and the session chair, uh, Chipeng Liu. Um, so in this session, we will see three talks. They are on black box separations and also on non-black box, non-constructive reductions. There are a lot of interesting things happening in this session. And um, our first talk will be uh, on sequential functions and fine-grained cryptography by Jashin Guan and uh, Hart Montgomery. So uh, Jashin will give the first talk. That's welcome. Thank you, Chicago introduction. Uh, I think it'll be five seconds before this turns on. So that's another 30 seconds. <laughs> All right. Hi, uh, I'm Jia Xingguan, and today I'll be talking about sequential functions and uh, fine grained cryptography. This is joint work with Hart Montgomery. And yeah, before we get started, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about a dream that I had last night. So last night I was dreaming and found myself. Uh, in, in Pagliato's Passiland. So what is Passiland? It's essentially a place where uh, one-way functions do not exist. And most cryptographic primitives do not exist in, uh, in Passiland. Okay, so you can see as a cryptographer, I was very scared to find myself in Passiland. Uh, and then out of nowhere, a mysterious old man appeared and told me that I have two tasks if I want to return to the real world. So the first task is I need to find a relic called sequential functions here uh, within Passiland. And the second task is I need to build some crypto primitives using uh, sequential functions. So, what are sequential functions? In the old man, he gave a very informal introduction of sequential functions. Uh, sequential functions are, roughly speaking, functions where uh, if you have a single processor, it takes a certain amount of time to compute. Uh, but if you have a lot of parallelism, it still requires you to take roughly the same amount of time. So, in other words, even if you have a lot of parallelism, it's not going to help you with computing a function. So in that way, this function itself is inherently sequential. So a special class of sequential functions that we'll be uh, working with uh, is called continuous iterative sequential functions. So the role is essentially the, uh, the sequential function. Uh, how you write it is essentially, essentially there is a short run function and just keep iterating, iteratively uh, applying the run function over and over. So this is a special class that we'll be uh, working with. All right. So um, sequential functions forms the backbone of what we know as time-release cryptography. So inside there, there's verifiable delay functions and time lock puzzles, and they all heavily rely on sequential assumptions. On the other hand, you know, in our in the standard model, one-way function is what we believe to be the most basic uh, critical assumption. Uh, within standard model cryptography. Of course, on top of that, there are other stronger assumptions. So the natural question is, how do these worlds connect? A prior work by Batansky et al., they show that time model puzzles actually imply one functions. But what about sequential functions, which is a little bit more fundamental within time release crypto? It's obvious to see that one functions do not imply sequential functions, but what about the other way around? Do sequential functions imply one-way functions? Understanding this problem will help us understand a little bit better about where sequential function lies within the whole cryptographic landscape. And also, personally, from a personal perspective, I'm very worried because if sequential functions imply one-way functions, that means they cannot exist in passive end, which means I will be stuck there forever. So there is me very concerned, uh, but luckily, uh, within this paper, we're able to show a oracle separation between sequential functions and one way functions. Specifically, we show that there exists an oracle and a function relative to the oracle that is sequential but not one way. So I'm happy, and there is some hope that I can actually find sequential functions within Passive and, and get back to the real world. And that's how I, I'm here today telling you about this. Along the way, we also explore the where the sequential function lies within the complexity uh, landscape. Uh, we show two results. First of all, we show that continuous sequential functions, CISFs, they are P space complete. 
And on the other hand, we show that a more general class of sequential functions called dynamic sequential functions, they're actually not in P space. Our talk today will focus on theorem one, which is the main result of the paper and is the most technically involved section. So for today's talk, I will be going over some high-level intuitions uh, and also challenges that we encounter during the proof. So what is our goal? Our goal is to find a function that is sequential in our one way. So here's a very natural attempt that you might want to want to try: is that uh, let's take a random permutation and in order to make it not one way. I tell you how do you evolve this random permutation, okay? Assuming this doesn't work, if you think about this following function, where you just compute x, x or with the random permutation of x, if you're familiar with block cipher, this is actually known as the Davis Mayer construction. For block ciphers, it essentially says that even if you even if you know how to invert uh, the random permutation p, you can still not effectively invert this function. So this is good for block cipher, but not good for us. Because it seems that in order to give the in order to give the normal we need to give the adversary a little bit more power than just inverting the oracle itself. So let's jump to our oracle separation result. So we'll be working in the generic blue model for a group of large and model P. And we'll work with Schub's generic model, so in the sense that we'll be working with labels. So the way we access the group elements within the group is through a set of labels of n this long. Okay, you can think about there is a mapping between the group elements to the, to the set of labels. And uh, I mean, notice that uh, the, the, size of the, the size of the label set is much, much larger than the total number of group elements. So in the sense that the valid labels are actually very sparse. So if you draw a random label, it's very likely it's not going to be a valid one. So the oracle that we're thinking about is a very, very simple one. So the oracle is going to have in there hard-coded a generator of the group G. And it takes as input a label for a group element A. And what's going to give you is a group element, or is it a label for the group element G times A? So essentially, in fact, it just does the group multiplication by G for a fixed generator G. Okay, so it's a very simple oracle here. But as we have seen, in order to give the atoms the power to invert things, just giving out the inversion of the oracle is not enough. So we give out the atoms a much more powerful inversion oracle that takes an arbitrary binary circuit and with a desired output y, and it's going to invert the circuit for the adversary. It's going to output either x or bot. So if it outputs to x, that means c of x is equal to y. And if no such x exists, it's going to tell you bot. And this is going to run, uh, we have this running time proportional to the size of the circuit, c. So here's one specific challenge here, is that we want this inversion circuit to be as powerful as, uh, we want it to be powerful enough to, to ensure there are no more winners you can get. But think about the circuit. Let's say you take a, take a multiplication gate and you can feed it into the inversion circuit, right? And let's think about the circuit. If we want this to be not one way, that means we must be able to invert this circuit itself. So which means, this should be able to be put as the circuit as an input to the inversion, inversion uh, oracle. Okay, so that means our definition for the inversion oracle must be recursive, in the sense that the input to the inversion oracle could contain inversion gates recursively. Okay, so and with this definition, it's still fine for us to define this inversion oracle because we just need to count the total number of gates within this uh, gigantic recursive circuit. So what this says is that if you construct any circuit using binary gates, multiplication gates, and this uh, inversion oracle gates, then we can just plug that in into an inversion oracle and that will uh, invert, invert the circuit for you. So in that way, you cannot construct any one-way uh, one function uh, if, if we give you these oracles. So no one is easy, but Seems like we have the second half of the task is we want to find under these oracles how to find the sequential f. So our construction of the sequential f is pretty straightforward. You take your uh, take a take a label x, and all you need to do is to literally apply the multiplication oracle on the input x until you arrive at an output. So notice that this by itself, if you're only given the, the multiplication oracle, is inherently sequential because it's a 
essentially it's essentially of cost to the to the oracle, and we can't do any faster than time t. However, we also give you this inversion oracle. So maybe we can do something using the inversion oracle to help you compute this faster. So what what might you do? Consider this case. Consider this specific uh, intuition. We want to show that your inversion oracle cannot help you with shortcutting the sequential computation. So let's so for our function, you start with a group, uh, start with a label for group element A, and we're going to iterate what we call the multiplication oracle. You get to g times a, g squared times a, all the way until you arrive at the answer. And what we want to say is that using the inversion oracle, you cannot bypass some of these sequential computations. You still have to follow this computation path, which makes it sequential. So a specific thing you can do, for example, if you think about this circuit, so the circuit uh, takes the output of the multiplication oracle, and uh, you bit mask to extract the first bit. And now we try to invert it and say the first bit that your output must be a one, okay? So in other words, you must find a uh, you must find a label for a group element such that if you pass this through a multiplication gate, the resulting label starts with a one. Okay, so very easily you can find an answer to this. So you can find some x such that uh, or, or, or such that the multiplication gate on x uh, begins with one. Okay, so you know something starts with one. Now there must be either one of the cases it either begins with one zero or with one one. So you can now extract the first two bits and require it to be one zero or one one. And at least one of these uh, is gonna succeed. So you can repeat the process on and on until at the end, you arrive at a, you are able to extract a label. Let's say for example, in this case, one zero, one zero, one, one zero, one. You can extract the label out of nowhere. And uh, that's, that's a problematic because if the adversary is able to conjure a label, that means the adversary don't need to follow along the path to, uh, according to the sequential function. What I want to say is that even if you're able to conjure these labels out of nowhere, it's, this function is still sequential. So here's how we formalize this. If you think about this computation path of our original sequential function, if you think about making further iterations of, Oracle, uh, of the multiplication Oracle afterwards, eventually it's going to wrap around and come back because we're working with cyclic group. Now let's put things very nicely into a cycle, all right? So the green arc can be thought of as the, as the, as the honest computation path that you will take to evaluate the sequential function. So you sort of start off from the top node uh, there, and you gradually grow this entire green arc eventually until you reach the target node. So we, we formalize three intuitions here. The first intuition is that any label that you are able to instantiate using the version oracle, it is either only connected to the green arc, in other words, it's like it lies very close to the green arc, or it's just uh, randomly located on the, on the entire rest of the cycle. Now this is true, because notice that the location of a label on the entire cycle solely depends on its corresponding group element, or more specifically on the display log of this group element. And the only way that you can fix the group element is by connecting it to the green arc, because only the position of the green arc is known. So unless it is somewhere on the green arc, then you know what its group elements are. Otherwise, it's just somewhere, somewhere random. The second intuition that we formalize is that uh, if you think about an arc, which corresponds to a sequence of oracle invocations, in time d, you can pretty much only extend both sides of the arc by almost d steps. This essentially comes from the fact that we're inherently just doing se sequential in, uh, invocations of the random oracle. And last, uh, last we show that uh, arc joins actually happen with negligible property. So what are arc joins? Let's imagine you have two arcs on the entire cycle, but they're close enough. And then you start evaluating, uh, you start evaluating the multiplication oracle on both sides of these arcs, and eventually they will merge into a single arc. And if you merge into a single arc, then you can potentially break intuition two, because uh, although each one of them can only grow by these steps, but if you merge them together, they have to grow by pretty much uh, a lot. And in fact, we show that uh, these arc joints are actually uh, very unlikely to happen. The reason is that the total number of arcs is going to be polynomial number of arcs, and these arcs are only polynomial length. 
But the overall the length of the entire cycle is going to be exponential in the security parameter. So everything is very sparse. So you would expect the arcs to be very far away from each other. So if you start growing them, they will not merge into, uh, merge into a single arc. So with these three intuitions, we're able to combine them. So intuition one essentially says that uh, any new label that you conjure out of nowhere is not going to help you unless it's on a green arc. So that means if you want to reach the target node, all you, all you can do is carefully grow in this green arc until it reaches the node. And intuition two and three combined tells you that you cannot grow that arc too fast. Okay, so with this, it seems like we are able to get a sequentiality result. But there's one small additional subtlety here. Now let's take a look at the original, uh, the circuit that we looked at, where we can use it to find a uh, label starting with one. Now imagine, instead of telling you a specific, a specific input X, let's say it outputs bot. What does that mean? That means it tells you that no labels starts with, uh, starts with one. Okay, in other words, all of the valid labels for the group elements starts with zeros. This is, seems like a lot of information given within a single query. Okay, I mean, this seems very pretty bad. So we want to say that either this doesn't happen pretty often, or uh, this gives you uh, very little information. So the other thing that we use here is that we can think about, instead of sampling all of the labels for the group elements in the very beginning, we can sample them lazily as more queries are being made. Okay, so in that way, how do we answer an inversion query? We can imagine there is a large set, a w exponential set, of all the possible label assignments that are consistent with the prior queries. And within here, there is a very small subset, a small subset of these, such that these are the label assignments where the circuit, the circuit query is not satisfiable. Okay, and everything else, there is a satisfying, uh, there is a satisfying assignment. So now, how would you answer, how would you answer, sample your answer according to this according to these sets? Well, essentially, you just drop a randomly drop a needle, and if it lands in the green area, you can sample a you can sample an answer there. Or if it lands in the red area, you say it is not possible, unsatisfiable, and you will just uh, and you will just like uh, you will just output bot, and you will actually rule out everything in the green area. So if you want to give get more, a lot of information from a single query. That means your green area, the, the label assignments that you want to roll out needs to be large. And that means your red area needs to be very small. In other words, this, uh, it's very less likely for you to actually get a bot response. So if you think about this, if you want a bot response to happen with reasonable probability, the, the information it will give you, the impact you will have on the label distributions is now actually going to be minimal. Well, just being minimal is not enough. Maybe it's minimal on the entire distribution of all of the labels for all of the group elements, but maybe you can sort of somehow target it into a specific for a specific group element. And we show that no, that's not possible. The impact will be even distributed around the entire cycle. So the impact you will have on the label distribution for any given group element is also minimal. So with that, we're able to show sequentiality of our results and that completes the oracle separation. And uh, then there's a second task of constructing uh, constructing crypto primitives using this uh, sequential function. I'll briefly talk about uh, what we did. We didn't construct uh, standard primitives that are secure up to sub, sub, sub exponential amount of time, but rather we construct primitives in a fine grained setting, which are only guaranteed security up to a polynomial amount of time. We show three results. Uh, the first one uh, comes from uh, comes from CISFs, where we're able to construct SKEs and max. And second, we construct uh, we construct fine grained PKE from verifiable delay functions and IO formal circuits. And lastly, we construct uh, commutative uh, sorry we, we construct key exchange from commutative sequential functions. And um, here is a very brief overview of the first construction, which will take thirty seconds. And so essentially, the idea is that we cannot catch up with sequential assumptions. What will happen is that you can imagine the honest parties, they just share some secret, uh, some secret uh, CISF together with a starting point. So this is going to be a shared key. And they do some pre-computation. They iterate, uh, they compute the whole computation path of this function up until the end. And when they want to encrypt something, well, they will use, uh, say, the first hop along the computation path. When an answer comes over, the answer has no information about X, uh, a priori. So uh, whatever information you use here, the answer has no idea about. However, for the second, uh, for the second epoch, 
uh, what you will do is use the use the use the node that is three stop three hops ahead. Okay, so you'll move forward by two hops. But the sequentiality of the sequential function, the adversary could try to catch up, but the adversary can only catch up one hop. So, so the actual secret information you use is still two, one hop ahead, and the adversary is not able to use it to, to break your encryption. So that is the intuition that we have. All right. And so with that, we happily find sequential functions, and we're able to escape passive events by constructing uh, crypto primitives, use it, and uh, the old man says further, and we're able to uh, come back. So then the old man did put some open prompts there. So if you want, you can take a look. And uh, while you look at it, I'll be happy to take any questions. And uh, since we don't have uh, much time, uh, we can take the question offline. And for the uh, next talk, it's uh, collision resistance from multi-collision resistance for all constant parameters. Uh, this work is by Jen Bozak and Stefano Tassara, and Jane is going to give the talk. Okay. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, hi, everyone, everyone, and I'll be presenting my work with Stefano on multi collision resistance. Um, okay, so uh, this talk will be about hash functions, and the most common security requirement for hash functions is collision resistance. So we are everyone's familiar with uh, collision resistant hash function, or CLH for short. So this is a family of shrinking functions in which it's hard to find a collision. And so concretely, and the efficient adversary, uh, when given a hash function set for primary CLH, uh, should be able to find two inputs that map to the same output with probability that's at most negligible in the security parameter. And so today, uh, we're going to be considering a generalization of this notion called a multi collision resistant hash function, uh, or an MCRH. And so an MCRH is exactly like a CRH, except that it should be hard for the adversary to find size T collisions for some parameter T. Uh, rather than just size two collisions. And so a CRH is just an MCRH where T is equal to two. So a couple of observations about the definition. So first, it might seem that this definition becomes weaker as T increases. And this is because if we increase T, we require the adversary to find larger collisions to break the security of the primitive. And this might be better for the adversary, and therefore it could make the primitive weaker. And so this directly means that CLHs, which have the lowest setting of, two, of t equal to 2, imply all other MCLHs. Uh, furthermore, we can show that the existence of any MCLH implies the existence of one-way functions. Uh, to do this, you can notice that the MCLH is itself a distributional one-way function, and then use the standard result that distributional and plain one-way functions are equal. And so one reason to study MCLHs, besides them having a very simple and natural definition, is that they're this intermediate problem between one of the functions and collision resistant hash. And so since we don't know how to build collision resistant hash functions for memory functions, uh, studying this intermediate kind of can help shed light on in what way uh, collision resistance is stronger than one of these. Another reason to study multi collision resistance is that. There's a recent round of works showing that multi collision resistance is often enough in applications that traditionally require collision resistance. Uh, so there's some work showing that you can build constant and statistically high end commitments, uh, succinct arguments for MP, and various low interactions, your knowledge arguments, all from just uh, multi collision resistant hash functions. And so, in light of these works showing that MCLHs are often sufficient in place of CLHs, it's natural to ask the question of whether multi-collision resistance is actually as powerful as collision resistance. So if there is a TMCLH, can we use this to build CLH? And so we answer this question you know, like affirmatively for any constant value of T in the setting of infinite locked-in security. 
So to remind you, in the standard setting, we say if it's secure, if the security condition holds for uh, sufficiently large values of the security parameter. So the setting we're looking at is a bit different. Uh, it's infinitely open security, which means that the security condition just has to be infinitely many security parameters. So let's put all those out into context. So the assumption we're starting with is the existence of a multi equation resistance hedge function with a constant parameter t. So this is the same assumption that was used you know, like six years ago by Colonel Botsky and Rodov, and we used it to construct distributional uh, equation resistant hash. And so distributional equation resistant hash functions are a weak variant of equation resistant hash functions in which basically the adversary is asked to sample uniformly from the space of collisions. And so we would like to construct plain collision resistant hash functions, which imply this notion. And there is another prior work that does start with multi collision resistant hash functions and construct CRHs. Uh, this is by Rothman and Basilian from two years ago. Unfortunately, they require that the MCRH that we start, start with has t equal to three or t equal to four. So this is a stronger assumption than the one we make. And so essentially, our work is taking the weaker assumption and producing the stronger result. And this means that all the three shared assumptions are equivalent. And as I look, both of these prior works are in the infinitely often setting, and we are in the setting for the rest of the talk. So before we look at the proof, I want to comment briefly on the shrinkage in these functions. So how far do we need these functions to be? And if you're familiar with collision resistant hashing, you might think that this doesn't really matter. Because for collision resistant hash functions with standard techniques like local download, you take a collision resistant hash function that just shrinks one bit from its input, and you can use this to produce a collision resistant hash function with arbitrary polynomial shrinkage. Unfortunately, for multi collision resistance, we don't have these types of uh, techniques and such strong results. And the only reason is that the techniques that work for collision resistance fail when you try to start with just something that's multi collision resistant. And to see a total example of this, you can think about composing functions. So if I compose two collision resistant hash functions, I've got something that's still collision resistant. But if I take two, um, two MCRHs, there's no reason that the composition should be a TMCRH. And so in general, when it's relevant, uh, we will look to MCRHs like this. So we we'll specify the domain, in this case, two M bits, um, strings, and dual range. OK. So now we're going to look at the proof. Um, so the main theorem is a little bit stronger than what I said before. So it says that if there's a TMCRH, then there's, for a constant T, then there's also an infinite locked MCRH. Uh, and it also says actually that the MCRH we started with just has to be shrinking by some arbitrary small constant factor one plus epsilon. So the way we prove this is by we have two transformations. So the first one is the core of our work, and it's about improving the security of the multi collision resistant hash function. So it says that if there's a function family which is hard to find size t squared collisions, then there's also a function family which is hard to find just size t collisions. And then the second part of the work is a domain extension result that basically says that if there's a MCRH shrinking by a factor of two, then we can also construct an MCRH that shrinks by a factor of lambda for some large constant lambda, and we have some control over the collision resistance parameter. So first we're going to look at how we can compare these two results to get the main theorem. So in the main theorem, we're starting with a multi-collision resistant hash function that's shrinking by factor one plus epsilon. And the first thing we do is we improve this to a factor of two just by removing the multi one construction. And then this causes the collision resistance parameter to go, but it's still constant. And so we can apply our domain extension result and get um, an MCRH that shrinks by some large factor lambda. And the control of the coexistence existence parameter is such that it's not bigger than uh, two to the end over two. And from here on, we just apply the first step of the proof. So we're improving the coexistence existence parameter. And each time we do this, we get half the shrinkage and we also uh, decrease the exponent of the coexistence existence parameter by a factor of two. Uh, and if you work this out, this gives us a coexistence as a Nash function. 
Okay. So now I'm going to go into the use of this year's results, and it was just a little bit about step two because it's the less interesting of the two. Uh, so basically, this result means kill as independent hashing and uh, then a hash tree to shrink the input a lot. So this is a similar thing to the one in prior works, uh, but it's simpler in the sense that uh, what we use kill as independent hashing prior works had to use um, codes that were specifically tailored to this. And so I'll refer you to the paper to see how uh, we do a similar proof and how it gives us better parameters for our inclusion. What I want to spend the rest of the time on is this step one, uh, which is quite interesting because it's now backbox and it's now constructive. Uh, so we'll see why this is when we look at the proof. So we'll start with just the blueprint. So I um, will we'll fill in some of the details after. So we're starting with a T squared MCLH, so consider we have some function sampled from an H, and then we use this function to build a family you know, of functions F, and this is going to be some black box where they specify C. And now there's two cases. Either this happens to be a TMCLH, and then we're just finished, and if not, then we'll have some attacker against this, this function field. And now comes the most interesting part of the proof, which is that we use this attacker and the functions f to define another function family. And we can argue that this function family must be a TMCLH. So we're using the attacker in the construction. This is the most non standard thing. And so, how do we argue that the second function family is a TMCLH? Well, it's by contradiction as usual. So, if it isn't, then there's an adversary problem that attacks it. We're going to use this adversary A prime along with the adversary O to break the original MCRH. Okay, so to make this precise, there's three things I need to tell you. First, I need to define the functions F, then I need to define the functions G, and then I need to show you how the reduction works. So let's start with F. So functions in this family are indexed by functions H from the original family and strings S. And then next, by taking an input x, they prepend s to this input and then they hash on their h. So h is a from the original family, it's a function from k and bits to n bits, and s is half the length uh, of its inputs. And so if this is a TMCOH, then it has half the shrinkage of the original family, so we finish with the claim of step one. And if not, we get an attacker against this function family. And so what we're going to assume for now is that this attacker is perfect, by which I mean that it succeeds with probability. And now we're going to use this attacker to define the functions G. So the functions can vary with Gs, we're going to uh, index by functions H, but we're going to find you, and we're going to take as input a string, um, which we're going to call S. We're going to pull the function F from the previous side, and then we're going to run the attacker against it. So this adversary will use the size T collision on this function F, and then G will output the image of this collision. And so this function G is also has half the shrinkage um, of the function H. So if we can prove that this is a TMCR, H will be finished. So the key thing to keep in mind here is how everything relates back to H. So the adversary against F is basically finding collisions in uh, H that share the prefix S. And now this function family of G's, G takes the input S and it outputs the image of the collision uh, that shares this prefix S. Okay, so now I'll tell you how the construction works. So now we need to take these size T collisions output by A and A prime and somehow uh, try to put things together and make a much larger collision against the original function. So it's so just T equal to three with the same idea works for any constant T. Um, and so our reduction is given some H from the original function family. And the first thing it's going to do is going to form this function um, G sub H, and it's going to feed it to the adversary A prime. This is going to give it two prefixes uh, assigned. And then for each of these prefixes, we form the function F corresponding to that prefix, and it will run the adversary A against this. And this will give us again T values for each of the SIs. And now the thing is that the SI concatenated with the XIJ, so S1 concatenated with X1, X2, X12, X13, and then S2 concatenated with X corresponding, X size, Js, 
but we call them the this is a size t squared collision and the original function family. So why is this? So there's two things to argue. First, that all the points in this fit in this collision are actually distinct. And this is where some prior works had trouble, they process very easily. And this is because uh, A outputs a collision, so within the scope of the one fix SI, the XIJs are going to be distinct. And because A prime outputs a collision, well, the SIs themselves are distinct. So that gives us that all the elements of this collision are distinct. And it leads to see why we collide under H. And for that, we will call the definition of G. And so since A prime is finding collisions against G, this means that we have these equations. And so now basically it's just thinking about what this really means. So the reverse cloud to set SI is outputting the collision basically on H that shows this prefix SI. So now if the images uh, of all these collisions for the different uh, inputs to A are the same, that just means that when we take the corresponding SI and we prepend it to the XIJ, all of these points are actually mapped to the same place under H. And so that completes the reduction. So we found a T squared collision against the original function family. So it can't be the case whether we have adversaries or an impairment that both work. And so we know that either the S or the ones um, are a T and server H. So this is the sense in which our proof is now constructive, which is that we don't know which of those two families is going to be um, the T and CRH, and we don't actually know how to define the G's without the adversary. Okay, so earlier I made an assumption that's uh, realistic, which is that the adversary is the problem. And when the cryptography is not a problem, if our adversary works with just some small probability, but for us, we're using this adversary in our construction of the functions G. And so the question is how do we define this function G if the adversary fails? And the solution is basically to define the solutions of actual MCLHs and then boost them up to four MCLHs. The actual construction details are relatively you not know, so interesting and technical. It's basically a bunch of resampling, but I really want to point out that this is something that has to be dealt with when we use our anniversary in a construction like this. Okay, so in summary, we saw that if there is a TMCH with some constant T, or for any constant T, then there's also a CH. And we saw that the starting MCH just needs to have some small multiplicative factor of shrinkage. And this was an infinite and often seven. And the, have these interesting properties that came from the anniversary, we will bring them back box and run constructive. And so I want to leave you with some of the questions. First, I think it's interesting if we can get groups of this result that are different in some substantial ways. So perhaps they're constructive or you know, black box or they work in the standard security setting. Uh, and secondly, we can extend this to super constant values of T. Thank you. I'm not taking questions. Any any questions? Um, if no, then I have uh, I think one question. <laughs> so if you don't care about the uh, like the compression parameter, then is that possible to answer the last question? Like extend that to super constant t imply. Uh, two collision resistant hash. Okay, so we don't know how to do this. And basically, the reason is that each time we take a square root in the collision resistance parameter, we need an adversary for this. And so once the collision resistance parameter we start with is super constant, uh, basically we have to define a super constant number of adversaries. And the, the adversary size will vary in the way it's too big, or if you're using some asymptotic definition, with the time by which the adversary kicks in, you'll get another adversary, which may also not make for such small parameters. Uh, so this seems to this constant T um, seems to be available for this sort of approach using so, Okay, thanks. So let's uh, thank the speaker again. Um, and next, um, we have the last talk in the session, which is structural lower bounds on black box constructions of pseudo random functions. And uh, this work is by Amos uh, Bimal, uh, Tom Martin, and Norm Mazar. And Norm will give the talk. Um. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, 
So this talk is about the black box construction of a pseudo-random function, and it's a joint work with Amos Berman and Tal Markin, which are here. Uh, so the uh, question of this work is, uh, what is the complexity of black box constructions of pseudo-random functions from PRGs? So, sorry. Um, so that just to make sure that we are all on the same page, let me define PRGs and pseudo-random functions. So pseudo-random generators, or PRGs, are efficiently computable functions from n bits to, say, 2 n bits, such that we cannot distinguish between the output of the PRG on a uniform input uh, from uh, two n uniform bits. And a uh, pseudo-random function is a function family indexed by a key k, such that for a random key, we cannot distinguish between uh, fk to a totally random function, in the sense that no efficient adversary can uh, distinguish between f in oracle to f or f in oracle to a random function. So the question is, uh, what is the complexity of black box uh, construction of uh, PRF from PRGs? And we know how to construct uh, pseudo-random functions from PRGs. We have the, um, uh, the GGM construction of uh, Goldreich, Goldwasser, and Michali. They show uh, a simple and elegant construction that uses an adaptive cause. So in the question of the complexity is how many calls to the PRG we need to, to do in order to evaluate the function on a single point x. So given x, how many calls we need to do to the PRG in order to get the output. And in GGM, we need to make an adaptive cause. I will um, show the construction later. And a uh, later work of Slavin showed a domain extension trick, and he showed that actually it is, it is enough to do super logarithmic number of adaptive cause to the uh, PRG. And the question of this work is, uh, can we do better? Uh, do, is it necessarily uh, to do super logarithmic number of adaptive calls, or can we do uh, uh, less calls to the PRG? And uh, as I said, in the last 40 years, since the work of uh, Goldberg, uh, Goldwasser and Michael and Levin, there was no improvement in this uh, question. There are a uh, construction of uh, now angle for specific assumptions for DDH, but we care about generic constructions, uh, black box construction from B PRGs. So why should we care? So one, uh, this is a fundamental question in crypto, and it's an old question without no uh, improvement in a lot of time. And also, the efficiency of PRF is important for many cryptographic primitives because PRF is very useful. And also, the importance of this question goes beyond crypto because we know there are connections between PRFs to complexity questions. So there is the natural proof paradigm of uh, Rasborov and Rudich that shows that uh, the existence of a PRF in some complexity class implies barriers on proving circuits lower bounds against this class, and also lower bounds against learning. So we need to know in which uh, complexity classes PRGs exist in order to know when we can use this barrier, or when, when we can use natural proofs to prove uh, lower bounds. And lastly, this question is most less understood. Uh, with respect like uh, the related questions, like the question of constructing um, PRGs for many functions for which we have uh, not tight, but good lower bounds on the number of calls we need. For this question of constructing PRF from PRGs, there are no uh, good lower bounds. And for example, we don't know to answer a very simple question, that a question that truly really started this uh, work in which we don't know to rule out black box construction of PRFs that only call to the PRG once. So given a point X, uh, the construction that calls once to the PRG looks like that. Given a key K and a point X, we compute some function S of K and X. Then we call in a black box way once to the PRG. And then we apply some arbitrary post-processing function on the output of the PRG on K and on X. This is a very simple scheme of constructions that we, uh, I think at least the majority of the authors believe that this cannot possibly be, be possible, but we don't know how to rule it out. And this is still an open question. So if you want, if like you take one thing from this talk, 
we don't know how to rule out uh, this thing. And we, we have partial results. So uh, Nelson Viola in the previous work showed us some specific class of post-processing functions. This is not possible for the class of uh, bit projections. Uh, this uh, class of post-processing functions takes uh, the output of the PRF is just the i-th bit of the output of the PRG when i is some function of current x. So there is some function L that output a number between one to n to two n because this is the output length of the PRG. And the PRF just output one of the bits of the uh, PRG. And they show that there is no uh, construction with this post-processing. And uh, for this construction, the post-processing function, given y, which is the output of the PLG, the key k and the, the point x, just output some bit of y. So uh, there is this function lkx that uh, output log n bits, which uh, we interpreted as uh, which bits of y to output. One of the results in this work is to generalize the result of mice and viola, and we show that actually we can deal with any post-processing function that only depends on logarithmic number of bits of, on k and x. So not only bit projection, but all, all post-processing that, that uh, depend too much on k and x. If, the output, if we allow the output of L to be linear, or the size of k and the size of x, then this is a general post-processing function, but here we only allow a small dependence. And actually we have a much uh, stronger result that I'm not going to, to read, this is too much information, but the main point here is that to the best of the, our knowledge now, one call construction may be possible. And like, it's a very cool question to understand if, if it's true. Okay, but, but we do prove something in this work. Uh, so we have uh, other results. And our main result is that uh, for a large class of constructions, uh, that natural or generalized uh, GGN, GGN is essentially optimal. In the sense that uh, I, I will formally define it, but some of the choices made by the GGN construction cannot be improved. Or if you want to construct a more efficient PRF, you need to think about uh, other structure. You cannot use the same structure of GGN. And this uh, natural ge generalization uh, structure is uh, three constructions. So um, now I'm going to define the, to show you the GGM construction and to define what it is, uh, three constructions. Three constructions are uh, constructions that looks like a, a binary tree. And uh, just for a convention, I'm going to give a name for every node in the binary tree. So the name of every node is the path, path we need to take from the root to the node in order to uh, reach it. So the name of the root of the tree is vbot, and vbot has two children, v0 and v1. The left children is v0, the right children is v1. And for every node vz, we have vz has two children, v0, the left children, and vz1, the right children. And the GGM construction uh, gives for every node in the binary tree a value, an n-bit value. The uh, root of the tree gets the value which is just the secret key k. And to give the value for v0 and v1, we just apply the PRG on k, gives the first n bits to v0 and the last n bits to uh, v1. And we do so for every node. So for vz, we give a uh, value for its children by applying the PRG on vz, given the first n bits to vz0 and the last n bits to vz1. So we do it for every one of the uh, nodes in the tree. And then the output of the PRF on a key k and the input x is just the value of the node vx. Meaning that we go from the, from the root down according to x and output the value of the node vrh. So for example, if x is 0, 1, we start from the root, the first bit of x is 0, we go left. The second bit of uh, x is 1, we go right, and we output the value that we reached on. So if the length of x in, is n bits, in order to compute this uh, value, we need to uh, go down the, in the tree for n levels. So the number of calls we need to do to the PLG is n calls, an n adaptive calls. We cannot do them in parallel. So the question is, can we do better? And as I said, we, we can do better with uh, the main extension trick. So Levin showed that uh, if you start from a two universal hash function from n bits to some super logarithmic number of bits, 
uh, and such uh, two universal R functions exist very efficiently and unconditionally, then instead of computing the GGM2 and the value of X, it is enough to compute the value of the pseudorandom function on edge of X. So we only need to go on the three omega of log n levels, of super logarithmic number of levels. And then the number of course we need to do is super logarithmic. But still we can ask, uh, can we do better? And in this work, we show this for three constructions, uh, we cannot do better. So let me say what are uh, three constructions. So uh, we generalize uh, the GGM construction in three ways. The first is that the value in the root of the tree can be any function on k and x. In the GGM construction, the value of the root is always the secret key. We allow it to, the, to be any value. The second is that the level of the children of any node can be an arbitrary function of the output of the PRG. So um, for every node Vz, in order to compute the value of its children, we apply the PRG on, on the value of Vz, and then we apply some post-processing function P0 to get the value of Vz0, and some post-processing function P1 to get the value of Vz1. And this can be arbitrary post-processing functions. And the post-processing functions can all also be different in every level of, of the tree. So in the GGM construction, P0 is just taking the first n bits and P1 is just taking the last n bits. We allow it to be any functions. And lastly, the choice of the part we take on the tree can be any function of k and x. So we output uh, the value of the node lkx when in the GGM, this function lkx either output x or edge of x if we use a uh, living extension. Okay, so, so we have this uh, three-way uh, generalization of GGM. And the main result in this work is that uh, there is no fully black box uh, tree construction of depth less than log n minus log log n. So we can not have tree construction with sub-logarithmic number of calls to the PRG. And GGM is, a, as I said, is a fully black box tree construction with depth super-logarithmic. And the, our result actually generalized for every uh, tree with, con with constant degree, not only binary tree, and for every stretch of the PRG, not only PRG that has uh, from n to two n, it can have any stretch, and also for a uh, weak PRF, which is uh, a weaker, as, as weaker security definition. Okay, so let me say something about uh, the proof. Uh, so the proof, uh, to prove it, we use the uh, Oracle methodology uh, following previous works. And we show uh, for every low depth uh, tree construction, we show an Oracle with respect to the exist uh, PRG. But if we use this PRG in order to construct the PRF, then we can break it efficiently. There is an efficient algorithm break. They break the PRF implementation when we use this, this PRG as the uh, PRG in the construction. And this is uh, the contradiction. Okay. Um, so our main contribution, contribution in order to show it is a technique to deal with adaptive costs that I'm, I'm not going to talk about it uh, much. But uh, we use ideas for mass and VR to show that instead of ruling out two construction, it's enough to uh, rule out sequential constructions in which we just, uh, we don't have the pattern in the tree. We just uh, call the PRG in a sequential way and output the last value. So we first choose some value S of according to K and X, then we apply uh, the PRG G and some post-processing function P1 to get V1. Then we do it again, apply G and P2 to get the value of V2. We do it uh, D times and in the end we output the value of uh, VD. And we showed that there is no such uh, sequential construction, and by the work of Miles and Viola, this is enough to, to roll out uh, three constructions. So for in the time left, I want to, to show you the ideas to roll out one depth uh, sequential construction, meaning that we only call the PRG once and apply a single post-processing function. And I'm going to assume that the output of the PRF is one bit. Uh, so this makes the, since I'm proving lower bound, this makes the lower bound uh, stronger. So the PRF on an input X uh, called to this uh, uh, function, apply this function S on K and X, 
then apply the PRG and the, the output, apply the post-processing function, and output the first bit of the output of the post-processing function. And what we're going to do is to choose the PRG such that we will be able to compute the value of FK on a point X from K and X without calling to G at all. So we don't know to know we don't need to know what is G in order to compute the value of the PRF. And this means that we can break the PRF without breaking G because the PRF is independent from G. So this is the idea. Uh, so let's try to do it. So uh, we start from a PRG G prime such that the first bit of the output of G prime is equal to the first bit of the input of G prime. Such a PRG can be constructed easily from any PRG. So we only need that the first bit of uh, G prime will be equal to the first input bit of it. And I'm going to assume that P is a permutation. So if the output of the PRG is 2n bits, then P is a permutation from 2n bits to 2n bits. This is for uh, simplicity. And I'm going to take pi to be the inverse of P. So pi is also a permutation. Now, the PRG that I'm going to use is the composition of pi on G prime. So to compute G on an input S, I compute G prime on, on the S and then compute the permutation on the output of G prime. And it is not hard to see that if uh, pi is efficiently computable, then G is a PRG because we just apply the permutation on the output of the PRG. But moreover, now if we look on the output of the PRF, then by definition, this is the first output bit of P applied to G applied to S on K and X. But G, by definition, is pi composed with G, G prime. So this is equal to P of pi of G prime of S of K and X. But pi is the inverse of P. So we can, uh, they cancel out. So this is just equal to the first output bit of G prime on S of K and X. But by the choice of G prime, the first output bit of G prime is just the first input bit. So we don't need to apply G prime on the input in order to know what is the output of the PRF, which is exactly what we want in order to break the PRF and not to break the PRG. Okay. Um, so the, the key point is that, is that we were able to choose uh, this permutation pi such that uh, if you apply P and pi on an input Y and take the first output bit, this is equal to uh, the first input bit. And to do with adaptive cause, we need something a little bit stronger, which is that for every i, the first i bits of the output of p composed with uh, pi can be computed from the first roughly i bits of the input y. And if uh, p is a permutation and pi is its inverse, then this is uh, trivial too, because the first i bits of, of this thing is just the first i bits of, of uh, y. So we can do it uh, also in, in this more complicated case. But uh, the question is what, what we can do if P is not a, a permutation in the general case. So for this, we, we prove some uh, technical uh, lemma. The, the proof of this lemma is uh, quite simple, but I think it's, it can be interesting uh, in other contexts. So we prove this for any function P, even if P is not a permutation, there exists some, uh, what we call a pseudo inverse uh, pi, such that a pi is almost a permutation in the sense that if we apply pi on the uniform distribution, we stay in the uni with something close to the uniform distribution. So we can apply pi on a PRG and stay with a PRG. But also for every index i, the first i bits of the composition of p and pi can be computed from roughly the first i bits of the input of this function. And in, like in the general case, it can be that uh, P depends on all of its input bits, but once you apply pi on the input, you only need to know the first bits of Y in order to compute this function. Okay, so to summarize, uh, we showed a law bound on uh, three constructions, uh, the depth must be logarithmic, and this is uh, close to be tied with uh, the GGM construction. Uh, we have more elements in the paper that I didn't talk about. And for open questions, so uh, to understand the complexity of black box PRF constructions, and more importantly, to roll out one call PRF that we don't know how to do. Thanks.
Any questions? Uh, Chris. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, really nice. So uh, this is really about your work, but uh, is there any work or have you thought at all about uh, the complexity of say PRFs from synthesizers or other stronger? Uh, so we did thought about separation, like lower bars of uh, PRF from synthesizer. I don't know if there are some those. Um, all right. I think um, it's uh, 2.40 already. And let's thank uh, the speaker again.